Hi, I'm Dr. Tom. I'm with Causenta Wellness and Cancer Care Center. And today I want to talk about false markers of success and things that people kind of uh, latch on to and they don't really understand, like it's not really giving them everything they expected. So one of those is uh, people saying, oh, I feel good. I, it, what I'm doing is working because I feel great. And so don't get me wrong, we want everybody to feel amazing. But what happens a lot of times is people forget that how you feel is important, but it's not specific enough to tell you what's happening at a molecular or cellular level. And what I see a lot of times is people say, oh, I feel great, and then I have to remind them, that's awesome. But remember, you couldn't feel the first cancer cell forming in your body. Our ability to perceive what's happening is at a certain level, and anything below that level, we just don't know what's going on. And so you're not going to feel molecules, you're not going to feel cells, you're not going to feel stuff until it reaches a tissue level. And I got a couple of um, sort of web pages here that I think will effectively communicate this. So this first web page here is from Sloan Kettering, and basically they did a good job of using a gumball machine. And there's different ways you could represent with uh, this gumball machines, but what I'm going to show you right now is, think of it this way. <clears throat> So you say, hey, I feel great. And imagine the uh, left gumball machine has the, these white gumballs, and these white gumballs represent cancer cells that are, you think are um, you know, cancer in your body. And on the right side is a gumball machine. It's got all these cancer cells with different colors. And so as the cells change from sort of white to multicolored, they're actually progressing like there's an increase in the number of cancer cells. But if you feel good, you don't know that. You don't know that the thing is actually changing and becoming worse. And so the point I make is that a lot of therapies, um, they revolve around, you know, people go somewhere and they get something that increases their energy. So because they have more energy, they feel good, but in no way did it actually kill, kill off cancer cells. And so I make that distinction because so people know like, hey, how you feel and actually killing cancer cells, they're not the same thing. Um, you want to feel good and you also want to see evidence that cancer cells are going. Another sort of false marker is people have a mass. Let's say you have a lump in your neck or a lump by your clavicle or some other part of your body where it's kind of like you could palpate something. And now you see that mass shrinking. So using the same gumball model, imagine like you had a therapy. We're going to look at the multicolored gumball side. And let's say the therapy targets all the yellow gumballs. Well, let's just say that those uh, gumballs were the easy cancer cells to kill. So they're out of the way, they're out of commission, that's great. So there is some mild reduction in the cancer cells. But the cells left over, the red, green, and blue gumballs, which are stronger cancer cells that the therapy doesn't touch, now those guys are going to get exposure to a therapy and become resistant against it and then make resistant clonal cells. So my point is that just because the mass shrinks, that doesn't indicate that the actual number of cancer cells is less. You want to have additional details to give you that confidence like, hey, I'm winning a war. So that's why it's important to kind of have an understanding of like how you're feeling and what you're observing and what does that translate to. Next, I want to kind of talk about here a lot of time people say I want to do one diet. But somehow that one diet is going to like, you know, treat their cancer because they read stuff online. This is a um, study, and uh, let me pull up the title here. Uh, it's a 2024 paper in clinical nutrition. It says, the role of the nutrition in malnourished cancer patients revisiting an old dilemma. And the main point I want to draw to your attention here is a conclusion. There is a gap between the suggestion of the guidelines which advocate the use of nutritional support to improve the compliance of patients facing intensive oncologic treatments or to prevent an early demise when patients enter a chronic phase of low nutritional deterioration and a poor use of nutrition in the real world practice. And here's basically what it translates to. Different patients have different levels of inflammation and they have different factors driving the cancer in their body. So it doesn't make sense to have a single suggestion for everyone. So the idea that you're gonna do one diet and magically everyone benefits, that doesn't fit our current understanding. Part of the challenge is that 
because there's a lot of differences in each person and there's a lot of differences in each person's cancer, it's hard to come up with consensus statements that all the top experts will agree with. The way that we deal with that is we focus on the individual and we give individual-based recommendations. So I don't say, here's something everyone should do. What I say is, here's something that you should do for what's in your body. And then the last one is that, you know, I thought this was a really good paper uh, produced. This is by um, anesthesiologists, and it says, why we fail at clinical trials so often. I thought that was really well, um, well written, and this is March 2024. But the main point is that um, he basically discusses that the overall success rate of clinical trials in the modern era is notably low, with an estimated success rate for bringing a new cancer treatment from initial development to U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval standing at only 3 to 5%. The reason why I want to bring this to your attention is how many times you hear about this new thing treats cancer. And so like the perfect example, like ivermectin, fembendazole treats cancer. The reality is that it's probably going to be maybe effective for 3 to 5% of people, maybe even less, maybe not work at all. But because it's new, all these people are jumping on it. And what I want you to see is there's real world evidence that it's very, very difficult to make something that can actually pan out over time and translate to real world results. So just because something's new and just because you're reading about it all over the internet, it doesn't guarantee a successful outcome. So what we want to do is focus on objective metrics, like what is going on in your body, what can you measure, and that's what you use to evaluate if what the treatment plan or what you're doing is working. Hope this was educational informative, and I hope that you can use this to improve your health. Thanks.